Our first reading this morning comes from the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. And just a quick note before we read, I know that today is Mother's Day and we will talk about that in a few minutes, uh, but it is also Ascension Sunday. It is the day that we celebrate that Jesus ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty as we just confessed in our Apostles' Creed. And so this is the story from the book of Acts of what that means uh, and uh, Jesus' last words to his disciples. Therefore, let us pay close attention to what the writer sets forth. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day that he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After suffering, he presented himself to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, the disciples asked Jesus, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom of Israel? And he replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive the power of the Holy Spirit when it has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while he was going and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. And they said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Our final reading today comes from 1 John chapter 5, verses 9 through 13. And there it is written. Now, if we receive human testimony, human witness, human evidence, the testimony, the witness, the evidence of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he has testified to his son. Those who believe in the Son of God have the testimony in their hearts. Those who do not believe in God have made him a liar by not believing in the testimony that God has given concerning his Son. And this is the testimony. This is the witness. This is the evidence. God gave us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. And if I write these things, I write them to you to believe in the name of the son of God so that you may know and have eternal life. This is the word of the Lord. I was talking a little earlier just a few minutes ago, about how we know that our mothers love us, right? And it can't just be the words or the phrases that we say that convince us. There has to be something more. Many of you talked about feelings or characteristics or experiences that you had. You had to have a testimony, a witness to that love that convinced you it was sure, and that's what I want to talk to about today is that word, that concept of testimony, of testifying. John tells us 
in chapter 5, verse 9, that although there are all kinds of human testimonies to be had out there, though we're surrounded by many sorts of voices telling us all kinds of things, John wants us to see and grab hold of the idea that God's testimony is greater than that. It speaks to us with a depth and a power that even surpasses what we were describing of a mother's love. God's character is greater than any other. God's testimony is greater. I was thinking a lot about that word this week, testimony and testifying. And I was particularly struck because for some of us in the room, the last thing we want to think about today is testimony. We've had our fill of testimony. I have. I don't know about you. There are some here today who probably could go the rest of their life without ever testifying again. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'll sort of catch you all up. Some of us here at the church were called into the General Equity Court in Passaic County because of a matter that we do pray and hope will you know, bless the church and, and the community in, in and around uh, this area in Woodridge. Now, I'm not going to go into, as I said, all those details, but I want to thank everybody who endured the grueling six plus hour marathon of testimony and testifying. And those who've worked even longer than that for many months on this matter. And I don't know if you've ever set in on a court proceeding before, but let me tell you, it will test the limits of your patience and endurance. It will do that. There, first of all, there's the physical discomfort of being in that place. Now, does everybody uh, feel good this morning? You feel cushy and nice in that pew that you're sitting in? And in case you said no, you better think again because at least you have cushions. Because in a courtroom, you don't get that. And that poor courtroom, oh my goodness, it was a hard wooden bench that I never want to sit in for the rest of my life. And we had to sit there for six and a half hours. These are lazy boys. Thanks be to God. You're sitting in lazy boys. And then there was the endless litany of papers submitted into evidence. Objection, counter objection. And then there were times where the tension was so thick in the courtroom. It was like electric. You could feel it. Not comfortable. And as I sat there, with my courageous and persistent brothers and sisters, I was struck with a sense of compassion, of pity. If you don't mind me using that word, I was struck with a sense of pity for that poor judge. I thought about it because my mind was wondering because I couldn't stay on track. I just, you know, my mind went numb after a while. That man has probably had to sit in that room for 20 years, who knows, and listen to this group or that group or this person or that party, this witness, this expert, give their testimony about a variety of different matters. And I felt sorry for him, one, because he probably had to do that six, seven, eight hours a day going through that. You can imagine every single day of your life having to go through that. Oh, my goodness. And at the end of that, when he goes home and he you know, sits down to dinner and eventually maybe curls up into bed, he has to ask himself two questions. The first is obvious, I think, as a judge. He has to ask himself, what does the law say, right? I mean, you can't be a judge if you don't ask, know what the law is. But the second and the most important question he has to ask himself is, who do I believe? Who can I trust? Whose testimony is reliable and sure. It cannot be an easy job. That's why I felt sorry for him. Humans are humans. 
And we make the issue hard. We fight with each other. We disagree. We look out for our own interests. We all have the innate ability to, you know, tell the story in such a way where we're the hero in that story. And there's this poor man, this poor woman, judges around the world who have to sit there and decide who's telling the truth, who is reliable, who is trustworthy. I do not envy that person. But as I thought some more about it, I realized that we all have to sit in his seat during the course of our lives. All of us here today are going to have to make judgments about who we're going to believe. Who are we going to trust? Who has a reliable witness? I asked you earlier about your mothers. How do you know that they loved you? They gave you a reliable testimony, a reliable witness about their character. That they loved you, that they sacrificed for you. But the truth is, is eventually you have to grow up and move out of mommy's protection and you're going to have to figure out who really loves you. Again, who can you trust? And the decisions we're going to have to make are going to impact us and our families and our friends and our neighbors. And it's all going to come down to whose voice have you heeded? Who have you followed? Who have you followed? Now, we're not alone in this. It's been like this always for human beings. We see exactly the same thing working as, uh, here in the book of Acts, right? It opens up with the writer, we assume, is Luke the physician, saying, uh, addressing the person he wrote it for, Theophilus. He's giving him an accounting of all the things that Jesus had done in his previous book, the Gospel of Luke. And now he is going to tell them about what happens after, what Jesus says in his final words, and what they're called to do, and what they're eventually going to accomplish. And we are asked the question as readers, just like the disciples were asked, or confronted with Jesus' final words, we are asked to consider who is it that we are going to believe, who are we going to trust. And it is not easy, because there are some claims here that are going to require much of us. Think about the first. We're told in verse 3, after Jesus' sufferings, what were his sufferings? He was nailed to a tree, deader than a doornail. And then he presented himself alive by many convincing proofs in speaking about the kingdom of God. Think about what we're being asked to believe right there. We're being asked to believe that this man, Jesus, who is the Son of God, died, was raised, resurrected, filled with God's life-giving power, and then went around explaining to them how his death confirms that he was the Messiah, fits into God's plans for them and for the kingdom. And it doesn't make sense to them at the time. They're filled with their own questions. They're perplexed. They can't put it together. Verse 6 records their question. Lord, is this now the time finally when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? They can't make sense of it because they've been expecting Jesus to be a different kind of king, a different kind of Messiah. They can't see how a cross and a rolled away stone fit into everything that they've been told about what God is going to do and how they can't see how this is going to bring them victory. And then Jesus says, well, it's not time for you to know when these things the things that the Father has appointed by his own authority. Jesus is telling them, you're going to have to trust me. You're going to have to hear the testimony that I'm giving here in my very body and all that I've taught you before. And you're going to have to believe me. You're going to have to rely on that. And then we're asked, not only just like those disciples, if we can hang on to those things, if we can hang on to that witness that Jesus gives us, we are also told about the coming of the Holy Spirit, this presence that will fill us and come and give us power to go and bear witness, to be living testimonies to the living presence of Christ. It's a hard thing 
Jesus is asking for us. And then here is the capper to all of that. If he were still with us, if he were still standing next to us here, if we could put our hands in his side and in his hands and in his feet, we could do that all day. We could believe him. We could trust and we could rely. But he's not standing here because what does Luke and here in the book of Acts tell us? That when he had told them all these things, when he had commissioned them to be witnesses and living testimonies, what happened? He ascended into heaven. He's been seated at the right hand of the Father. We are being asked today whether we believe and can rely upon the witness and testimony that Jesus is Lord. Do you believe? Can we trust that Jesus is Lord of heaven and earth? That all things are under his feet? And though we can't quite see it fulfilled today, the day is coming when he shall return and finish the job. Can we believe? Is that witness and that testimony reliable? It's a funny thing, that word, testify, testimony, witness. The Greek word is marturos, from which we get martyr. Not just are we being asked, can you believe? Can you trust and rely, like sort of in the back of your head? We're being asked, can you trust and rely in the same way we talked about a mother's love that goes to the deep core of your heart? and affects everything that you do and leaves fingerprints all over you and changes the very course of your life. We're being asked, can we grasp this truth with that same intensity so that it shapes us and sends us out into the world so that we might give fruitful witness even to the point of surrendering our very lives for the sake of the testimony of the love of God in Christ Jesus. Can we believe it? Is God's testimony greater in our hearts? That judge in that equity court has an easy job compared to this one. Now, there are a lot of voices and there are a lot of testimonies out there that are going to try to convince you otherwise. There's going to be the cynical skeptic that goes around talking about, you really believe that Jesus was ascended into heaven? Really? And then try to make your belief seem absurd. There will be those who will come along and try to poke holes in the idea of Jesus being resurrected from the dead. I mean, I'm sorry, folks. We are claiming this is a one-time event in human history. It's unique. It's never happened before, and it will never happen again until the end of all things. Yes, we get it. It's not going to be verifiable as we would like it to be. We have eyes that can see and ears that can hear, but only what's right in front of us. But here's the thing. If you were left to your own devices on this question of whether you can rely and trust in the witness you've been given that Jesus is Lord, if it was up to you alone by how much you believed by your own strength of power, if it was up to you like that poor probate judge to have to judge between one or the other and parse out all the arguments and look at all the facts, you know, look, the truth is you'd probably get the answer wrong. You'd get the answer wrong. Because the truth is that the testimony, the witness, the evidence that means the most in our lives have nothing to do with the words that are coming out of our mouth or the things that we can investigate. They have to do with the heart. They have to do to a living witness and testimony that speaks to the deep down inside things where each of us are and convinces us of, of its proof. I could tell you all day that I love you, I love you, I love you, and it wouldn't hold a single thread compared next to a mother's love as we talked about. Because there's a whole body, a character, a witness that gives that power. And the only thing that can convince you of this testimony is not your own power, it is the testimony of the Holy Spirit. 
The only thing that can convince you is God's work inside of you, working within you, convincing you that God is just, God is reliable, God is trustworthy and sure. There is never anything that can happen in which He will fail you. In our hearts alone, we hear the gospel message. And it testifies to the only thing that we need to hear that is necessary in this life and for our salvation. It is the one question that resides in the deepest part of who we are waiting for the answer that God will give. And here is what you need to hear. Here is the testimony that you need to cling to. God gave us eternal life and this life is in his son. You could sit there and read scripture till the cows came home and it wouldn't convince you if it was just a matter of the words on the page. I could sit there and preach at, to you sermon after sermon after sermon after sermon and it would make no difference whatsoever if it was just by my power. But it is by the testimony of the Spirit alone that the truth of that statement, that God has given us eternal life and has given it in the Son, it is by the presence of the Spirit that we are convinced that this is true, that we can cling to it and we can rely on the witnesses we have been given. That we can navigate all those conflicting stories. That we can confess that Jesus is Lord. The testimony of God is greater, brothers and sisters. The testimony of God is greater. By this testimony, all that Scripture reveals becomes the bedrock upon which we can base our lives, upon which we act. It forms every aspect of who we are. It's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to leak down, so to speak, into every corner and crevice of our lives. It's going to impact how we treat one another, how we treat our relatives, how we treat our spouse, how we treat our neighbor, how we conduct business. It's going to change us. And it's going to fill us with a life-giving hope. And when we receive this testimony, when we receive this witness, when we're embraced by it, like we are embraced by the love we were discussing earlier. When we receive it, we'll be so transformed. Our care and our love and our witness will be so shaped by it that we will become living testimony, life-giving, breathing witnesses to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. When the sea billows roll, when the stress comes in, when the anxiety surrounds us, when the uncertainty seems just so thick you could cut it with a knife, we will be the ones in the midst of the storm hearing the voice of our master, peace be still, abide with me. We are his witnesses. That's what it means to testify to him, to be ruled by his life-giving power, that all that we are is shaped by his presence and his testimony living within us. We are his witnesses. And when you leave this place today and you go out into the community and you interact with others, you are called to continue that work of witnessing, that work of testimony, of being living evidence of the Lordship of Jesus Christ in every single word and deed that you perform. We are Christ's evidence in the world that he reigns. And that's a tough job. But I give glory to God for it. Amen.